Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and thank you to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. I am a self-taught historical sewist and I recreate garments that I see in fashion plates and museums entirely by hand using period appropriate materials and techniques wherever possible. So. If that's the kind of thing that you're into, if you enjoy sewing or history or fashion or all three, then I cordially invite you to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so that I can keep bringing you the content that you want to see. It also helps my channel out. I'm really new. This is like my third video ever. So thank you to everyone who did support my channel and is supporting my channel. I hit 100 subscribers this week, so yay, that's awesome. Um, and I hope to hit more in the coming weeks so that I can keep giving you guys some content. Today we are going to talk a little bit about late 18th century fashion, specifically the chemise à la reine gown, which was the epitome of this time period and the fashion that characterized it. I wanted to talk about this gown because it is the precursor to other fashions that came afterwards, specifically the fashions of Jane Austen and the Regency period and the early 1800s. They were directly influenced by this gown and by all of the fashion in the 1780s and 1790s, so it's kind of hard to talk about Regency fashion without talking about what came before and what influenced it. And I will be talking about Regency fashion in the next couple of weeks because I am so currently sewing a Regency gown and I'm almost done. I finally finished the embroidery today, so I just have to do the construction process and I will be ready to show that to you guys. So I do want to do a video on Regency fashion, but before I do that, I kind of have to lay the groundwork and talk a little bit about the 1780s and why that decade in particular was so important for fashion, both in the Regency period and all the way to today. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about cotton and where it came from and the chemise gown. And then I am going to actually get dressed in my chemise gown. I made my own version of it just this past spring a few months ago. So I thought I would get dressed in all the layers and show you guys how it was put on and how women used to wear this particular garment. So that is why I am wearing my linen shift. I also made this by hand. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So. Without further ado, let's talk about the 1780s. Fashion in the mid 18th century, so the 1750s, 60s, and 70s, was characterized by a love of artifice. And this came from the idea that man had subjugated nature and it translated across all of the arts at the time. So in gardening, you can see it with these elaborately pruned and very architectural looking shrubbery. The way that gardens were laid out, um, it was to show that humans were dominant over it. Um, and it showed up in architecture, in music, when we talk about Baroque music with all the trills. It's like very elaborate um, and it showed up in fashion as well with this obsession with artifice. So in particular women's fashion, the silhouette was characterized by very wide hoops that were achieved by the use of panniers, which were two baskets that were attached to a woman's waist and the skirt would lie over them. And this would create the illusion of a silhouette that was very wide at the hips, sometimes so wide that women had to actually go through doors sideways. And the fancier the gown, the wider your panniers were. And so this was a trend right up until the early 1780s when fashion all of a sudden took more of a natural turn and silhouettes became a little more round, a little sort of more droopy. Even the hair came down in the mid 1700s. We see these elaborate hairstyles that were very tall, very poofy. Um, I'm not going to get into the details on that now because honestly that deserves its own video. Like these hairstyles were crazy. Um, and if you've ever seen like a Marie Antoinette Halloween costume, it will absolutely include one of those poofy hairstyles so I'm not gonna go into detail about that right now there were several fashion commentators at the time who made comments that when a woman was dressed up in her formal panniers and gown and she had her hair done up in one of these poofs her face actually appeared to be in the middle of her body which is outrageous when you think about it but this was the fashion at the time um, these gowns were also very elaborately decorated with frills and bows and puffs and sleeves made out of this frothy lace so it was a very maximalist a very more is more aesthetic and then in the 1700s everything kind of just drooped down it became more round more feminine and more natural and this was because of enlightenment philosophy that became popular at the time 
and how it influenced fashion. So I talked about that a little bit in my last video when I spoke about white work embroidery and where it came from. So go check it out. I'm gonna link it in the description below. So if you wanna know a little bit more about how enlightenment philosophy influenced fashion in the 1780s, definitely go check that out. Um, in fact, I recommend you do because it will help you understand this video a little bit more. Um, but anyways, it was actually a big trend at the time to, if you were wealthy of course, have little rustic hamlets and villages built around your property. And Marie Antoinette jumped on this trend and she had a little hamlet built on the grounds of Versailles at the bottom of her garden. and it's called the Queen's Hemo. You can go visit it today. I've been there a couple of times and it is like one of my favorite places in the world. It's so cool to visit, um, particularly because I'm obsessed with this time period. So um, if you know the history and you know the significance of it, like absolutely go visit, highly recommend. Anyway, so the Hemo was built between 1780 and 1783 and it was essentially a small functioning farm. She kept sheep and chickens and cows. Oh look, the chickens are out, mm -hmm. fabulous. Oh, the lilies look so beautiful. Oh, it's heavenly. Hello. And a lot of the vegetables and produce from that small farm actually supplied the kitchens at the Palace of Versailles. So it was kind of this back to nature movement. It was like the original organic eating, clean eating movement. So part of this aesthetic was to wear comfortable, cool clothing that reflected this countryside aesthetic. And in particular, a big part of that was the chemise gown. Now, the chemise gown became popular in the early 1780s, and it was modeled after gowns that were worn by Creole women in the French colonies, in particular Haiti and Mauritius, and places that were very warm and tropical. It was made out of a very, very lightweight, almost transparent cotton called muslin, and it was from India. It's different from the muslin that we know today, which is a little bit heavier, a little bit coarser. Modern muslin is used for crafting patterns and making mock-ups, hence why the mock-up process is often called making a muslin. But when I talk about muslin, I'm not talking about this coarse modern material, I'm talking about the thin, transparent cotton that we now sort of know as cotton voile. True Dakar muslin that comes from India is a little bit more transparent. So I actually have a bit of it here. And you can see, you can see my hand right through it. Like, sorry, the lighting's kind of crappy, but you can see how transparent this material is. There's almost nothing to it at all. There, you can see my tattoos through it. So this was what these gowns were made of and Marie Antoinette jumped on this trend. It was already a little bit trendy to wear them. Um, but she made it really, really big when she was pregnant with her second child. It was extremely hot that summer. They were going through a big heat wave in France and this being a time before air conditioning or ceiling fans, if you were stuck in a heat wave, you were kind of stuck. There was really no way to cool off and you had to just sit through it. It's no use, we'll never find the rare desert sandwich. So before the chemise gown became popular, women would wear gowns primarily made out of silk, especially in France. The silk was very important to the French fashion industry. It was produced in a place called Lyon and the queen and king were expected to primarily wear garments made out of Lyon silk because it was supporting the silk industry, which was really important to France at the time. So that was part of the duty of the monarch was to wear this locally produced silk. When Marie Antoinette was pregnant, she began wearing these Creole gowns made out of this really light transparent cotton that was imported from India because it was just really uncomfortable being pregnant in a heat wave and wearing all this heavy silk. It also fit into that countryside aesthetic that was really popular at the time and it matched her village. So I suspect she probably did it um, half for aesthetic reasons and half for comfort reasons. However, um, everyone else around her quickly jumped on the bandwagon and soon Paris was filled with women strolling around wearing little white dresses. In 1783, famously Marie Antoinette had a portrait painted of herself wearing one of her chemise gowns and it was shown at the Salon in Paris that year and it scandalized the public because it was as if the Queen of France was appearing before them in her underwear. So the gown created such a scandal that the portrait had to be taken down and it was then repainted with her in like a proper silk Polonaise gown. But that did a lot to actually damage her reputation. 
and a few years later when the gowns were still really trendy and in fact they were picking up steam a lot of women in paris who could afford to wear these really expensive white cotton gowns were were, were buying them like crazy at the time cotton was more expensive than silk because it had to be imported from india whereas silk as i said before was locally produced so it was actually a lot cheaper to buy than any other textile and actually most women would have owned a piece of silk even if you were a poor woman you probably would have owned at least you know a silk gown that was a hand-me-down maybe it had been worn by two or three other women before you but everyone at this time would have owned a silk gown silk was a very universal ubiquitous textile it was kind of like cotton for us right now but at the time because cotton was so novel and it had to be imported it was very expensive so this also created a big scandal because of the popularity of this chemise gown the the silk producers in Lyon began to complain that they were going bankrupt because nobody was buying silk anymore because it was not trendy so this did a lot to damage Marie Antoinette's reputation and did indirectly lead to her unpopularity and eventual execution during the revolution So that's not the only impact this gown had, however. If you have ever bought a cotton t-shirt or a hoodie or a pair of jeans, then you have also been impacted by the chemise à la reine because the demand for cotton was so high that other countries began to try to produce it. And this indirectly led to the cotton plantations in the South in the United States. And because these plantations were run by slaves, the United States was able to flood the European market with cheap cotton that was in direct competition with European cotton. And so when that started to happen, cotton became a lot cheaper and middle class and even some lower class people could now afford it and so garments began to be made out of cotton and that's when we see all these beautiful calico gowns and chintz gowns and eventually in the early 1800s that led to all of those beautiful um, floaty white dresses that we see in our favorite Jane Austen adaptations So that was how the chemise gown influenced fashion. There's a lot more in there to unpack. This is a very, very basic overview, um, but I, I don't want this video to go on forever because I actually do want to get back to my sewing. So um, I can go into more detail about any of this history. There's a lot to unpack, as I said. The chemise gown is problematic, both because it appropriated the styles of Creole women in the colonies at the time, and because its popularity indirectly led to the proliferation of the slave trade and to the plantations in the American South and the deep racial divides that continue on to this day. So it wasn't solely responsible for those things, but it did fuel them and it did contribute to the problem. So this is a problematic gown. However, it is also extremely important and it is probably one of the most important innovations in fashion in all of history. We wear the amount of cotton that we do today because of this gown. Cotton is our main textile. It is found in everything today, and that's because of this gown. Um, so it had a huge impact. Like I said, if you've ever bought a t-shirt or a hoodie or a pair of jeans, then you have been influenced by this gown. So as problematic as it is, it is ubiquitous in our culture, kind of like enlightenment philosophy. Our modern fashion is based around it and is a direct descendant of the chemise à la reine. So, it's a very important textile. Um, I personally am very fascinated with this gown. I always have been. This is my favorite gown in all of history, despite the fact that it is so problematic. Um, I've always been really obsessed with that time in history where Marie Antoinette and her friends frolicked in her little rustic village that she had built on the grounds of Versailles and pretended to be milkmaids. You've got to brush the dirt off a bit, but they're quite clean after that. Oh, I must do this more often. I love the country. Um, I don't know why, but this has just always been a fascination for me. I've always felt very close and connected with Marie Antoinette. Um, we have a very similar temperament, very similar vices and virtues. We even have similar astrological charts. And this gown was so much a part of her life. And so I wanted to know what it was like to wear it. So because I love this gown so much, I taught myself how to sew by hand because I wanted to recreate this gown by hand using the methods and and materials that would have been available at the time. My first attempt was all right for a first attempt, it wasn't bad. However, at the time, I didn't know the difference between modern muslin and historical muslin, so I made it out of the modern kind, so it was 
made out of the wrong material, but it did give me a really good idea of how this gown was constructed. And so I treated it as kind of a wearable mock-up. And then about a year and a half later, when I was more confident in my sewing skills and I had had a lot more projects under my belt, I decided to retackle this gown and try to make it again, this time out of the proper materials, using all of the techniques that I had learned up until then. So I did that this past spring and I pulled it off and I'm really, really proud of the garment that I created. I based it directly off the 1783 portrait of Marie Antoinette and I even recreated the sash with the gold stripes. So I am going to put that on for you today and I'm going to show you how a woman in the early 1780s would have gotten dressed in one of these chemise gowns and how she would have walked around. So without further ado, let's go check it out. The first layer of clothing was a shift made out of lightweight linen. This formed the principal undergarment for both women and men. Bifurcated underwear as we know it today didn't exist yet and was worn next to the skin. The shift would have helped regulate body temperature under all those layers while protecting the outer clothing from sweat and dirt on the body since outer garments often couldn't be washed. A pair of stays would then have been worn over the shift, laced up using a large blunt needle called a bodkin. Stays were a precursor to the corsets worn by Victorian women a century later, but unlike corsets, they're not actually meant to cinch in the waist. Stays essentially function as a bra, and I've heard women much more well endowed than I am say that they're actually more comfortable to wear than modern bras because they distribute the weight of the breasts around the torso rather than hanging them off the shoulders like bras do. The eyelets in 18th century and early 19th century stays were handworked as metal grommets hadn't been invented yet, so they can't be laced up tightly like corsets. Stays also helped to create the fashionable silhouette, which at the time featured a smooth conical torso that looked a bit like an ice cream cone. They also protected the body from the weight of the hoops, bustles, and petticoats worn over top, and trust me, you do not want to wear one of these outfits without a pair of stays. If you do, you will be very uncomfortable very quickly. Stays were worn by both upper and lower class women alike, and they were an integral part of a woman's undergarments and were regarded the same way as bras are today. Lower class women sometimes wore stays made from leather, and they were often strapless to allow the arms full range of motion, which is helpful when doing manual labor. Wealthy, aristocratic women had their stays made with straps that pull the shoulders back into the correct and desirable posture, even if they somewhat restrict your movements. They were interlined with a layer of buckram, which is a heavy linen canvas that's stiffened with glue and roughly the same weight and hardness as cardboard. A softer layer of linen was used as a facing and another layer as lining. Putting in the lining is the final step in constructing a pair of stays and it's usually just loosely tacked in because it's meant to be picked out and either washed and sewn back in or discarded when the lining gets all gross and dirty. Like so many other garments from this period, stays can't be washed, so that's another reason why you always, always want to wear a shift underneath your stays. Not only does it protect your skin from all the lacing and boning, it also protects the stays from dirt, grime, and sweat that builds up over time. Stays were stiffened either with dried reeds, called bents, or if you were wealthy, with baleen, which is a protein-based substance that comes from sperm whales. Baleen is made from keratin, which becomes flexible when heated, so historical stays would have gradually molded themselves to the wearer's unique shape and figure as the heat from her body warmed up the baleen. Mine are made with German synthetic baleen, which is a derivative of nylon and behaves the same way as historical baleen, but without the side of animal cruelty. No sperm whales were harmed in the making of my stays, I promise you guys. Most stays were laced up at the back, although sometimes you find examples of front lacing stays, so women in the 18th century would have needed help getting them on. Since I'm currently forced to do without the services of a lady's maid, I get around this by lacing them in front first and then turning them around before tightening the laces. As I said before, stays can't be tight laced, so when you're wearing them, it should feel like a firm hug around your torso. You shouldn't feel any pressure or discomfort whatsoever, and over time, as you break in your stays, they should get more and more soft and comfortable.
Finally, we have the stays on after what seems like an eternity. Because I was watching the camera and lacing at the same time, I missed one of the eyelet holes, so they're a little bit wonky, but whatever, they're on, that's all that matters. And I'm far too lazy to go back and reshoot it. Next thing to go on is the bustle or false rump, which ties around the waist with cotton or linen tapes. Hoops and panniers were mostly out of fashion by the early 1780s, and the bulk of the silhouette had moved from the sides of the body to the back. The bustle helps to hold the skirts out, and there were many shapes and sizes available at the time to accommodate the many different styles of gowns that were popular in the late 18th century, as shown by everyone's favorite sartorial cartoon from that time at the bum shop. This is my favorite bustle to wear under my chemise gown because it sits nicely under the horizontal waistline. Next is a petticoat made from silk taffeta. Elastics and zippers wouldn't be invented for another 150 years, so the skirts were put on with cotton or linen tapes that tied first from back to front and then from front to back, leaving two slits at the side for access to a pocket, which would have been tied on underneath. Because chemise gowns were so delicate and transparent, I don't like wearing pockets underneath mine, so I didn't put any on today. Petticoats would have been worn under every style of gown at this time and layered to fluff out the silhouette as much as possible. The outermost petticoat was usually visible because most gowns at the time were open at the front like bathrobes, so it would have been made in either a matching or contrasting color to the outer gown and decorated with flounces, puffs, embroidery, or lace. Petticoats would have been made from a variety of materials, from wool to linen to cotton to silk, and mine are made out of silk taffeta. I wasn't just trying to be fancy when I made these, silk taffeta actually serves a functional purpose. It's stiff and has a lot of body, so it holds its shape really well, meaning that I only need two petticoats to achieve the correct silhouette, rather than the three or four I might have needed if I'd made them out of linen or cotton. And finally, the gown. Almost all gowns at this time were open like a robe, slipping on and closing at the front of the bodice. A lot of gowns featured interior lacing that was hidden by a front panel, or they were closed by just pinning them to your stays with straight pins. Sometimes we see buttons, especially later in the decade and into the 1790s, but the chemise à la reine was always just tied on with cotton tapes at the waist, under the bust, and at the neckline. The sleeves also featured tapes at the upper arms and elbows, which when tied up create these lovely little puffs. It is really hard to tie up your own sleeves, however, alas the absence of a lady's maid, so I just leave mine tied up at all times, loose enough for me to slip my arms in and out. Once the gown is tied on, the tapes are then just tucked into the bodice to hide them. Chemise gowns were almost always worn with sashes that could be made out of wide silk satin ribbons or a transparent silk gauze that was popular for accessories at the time. Mine is made out of a silk gauze fabric with gold stripes shot through, which was a lucky find that resembles the original one Marie Antoinette wore in the famous 1783 portrait. And 
and we are finally finished getting dressed. Well, sort of. Except the hat. Straw hats were popular in the 1770s and 1780s. As time went on, they got bigger and floppier, and by the middle of the 1780s, they had brims wide enough to shade the face, perfect for all that wholesome outdoor country frolicking. Mine is decorated with a silk ribbon, silk flowers, and ostrich feathers, and honestly was just really fun to make. If you love historical clothes but are intimidated by drafting and sewing your own patterns, start with some good old-fashioned millinery. You will have the time of your life making hats, I promise. And that's it! I am now fully dressed and ready for some good old-fashioned picnics in the park. So I hope this was a little bit informative for you guys. Um, all in all, this is a very comfortable gown to wear despite all of the layers that go into it. Had I been getting dressed in the 1780s for real, I would have had somebody help me so this would not have taken quite as long. It is really hard to put on a pair of stays all by yourself, I have to say, but all in, it is very comfortable. I can definitely understand why you would have wanted to wear something like this in the hot summer rather than a heavy silk gown. Um, there is still silk in this. My petticoats obviously are made of silk. There are still a lot of layers. However, all of the layers are breathable. They're made of natural fibers. Natural fibers are a lot easier to wear even when it's hot out. They just breathe. They wick away moisture more easily. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to see more Get Ready With Me videos, I have also done costumes from the early 1900s and I have a lot more 1780s outfits as well. Like I said, I'm currently working on my Regency build, so as soon as my gown is done, I will do a Get Ready With Me in 1806 video as well. So if you want to see that, drop me a comment, let me know uh, what historical eras you would like to see me recreate and I can maybe do that for you. So. Hope that you all have a lovely day. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Toodaloo.